But the best thing about being an architecture student is having that background is you are way more advanced in terms of the way you can think. Business of Architecture UK, episode 15. Hello and welcome Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking to Harry Parr, co-founder of Bompass and Parr, self-proclaimed jelly mongers and multi-sensory experience designers. Now, Harry has a really interesting background. He began life as an architect, studying architecture at the Bartlett, and one of his final projects for his diploma was building jelly moulds and putting on a large Victorian dinner and this slowly grew into an events company and what we now see as Bompass and Par who have got numerous projects around the world they really have created their own genre of food design gustatory design multi-sensory experience design and for me I find his entrepreneurial spirit and taking the skills that architects have the planning the organization and our architectural thinking and combining it with this entrepreneurial spirit and flair to create a business which is for me still recognizable as an architectural company but it is so imaginative and creative and it really gives a lot of um, inspiration for many architects particularly people who are students who perhaps want to explore different avenues and I've got a quote here from um, Hans Hollein. Now, this is from 1966, and he says, Architects have to stop thinking in terms of buildings only. Built and physical architecture, freed from the technological limitations of the past, will more intensely work with spatial qualities as well as the psychological ones. The process of erection will get a new meaning. Spaces will have more consciously have haptic, optic, and acoustic properties. A true architecture of our time will have to define itself and to expand its means. Many areas outside traditional building will enter the realm of architecture as architecture and architects will have to enter new fields. All are architects. Everything is architecture. So on that note, please enjoy this interview with Harry Parr. It's a great Privilege to be able to chat with you, Harry. So thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks, Ryan. And I just want to know, like, just to begin with, how did this? How did your company begin? What's the sort of the story? So it started, and you'll probably remember this uh, in what was the the holidays between uh, the first and second year of doing diploma at mm. the Bartlett, and myself and my friend Sam Bompers decided to start a jelly stall. And start a jelly company and we set our sights on getting a stand at borough market yeah which they went ahead and refused straight away they thought it was a ridiculous <laughs> idea uh, but we weren't to be put off so we then started getting into a world of jelly and seeing what we could do with our product and how did you you how are you utilizing your sort of architectural training to move into this world so the initial thing in the early days was jelly molds yeah and sam and i liked the idea of victorian jelly molds and we were then somewhat shocked to see that they cost about 300 pounds each <laughs> so we immediately thought hang on a minute how can we have a jelly company we want nice jelly unmolded on the plate how can we serve it for lots of people if we can't get all these molds mm. so at the time 3d printing was just coming in and i knew lots of uh 3d cad stuff so i like making models in rhino so it was quite easy really just to start printing stuff i think the bartlett just had its first um z corp 3d printer so we started printing uh molds as it were and then mm. vacuum forming them and then before we knew it we could have as many molds as we wanted and it really wasn't so expensive and you found that there was a like there was a sort of a market for that available well in in the initial early days i think we created our own market so I guess our first 
commercial job was probably unpaid and I think was for Sam's mum and we served some jelly to some beavers and I think we realised there was beavers and scouts we realised that they actually preferred the chocolate brownies (laughs) that were on offer and that you had to pay for than the jelly but actually very quickly we realised that people love jelly and Mm. for them it was something that brought back this idea of nostalgia Mm. and it was interesting seeing people react to food in a way that we hadn't seen before. So we knew there was something very powerful in jelly. We mm. just didn't know how to harness it quite at that moment. Mm. And it's quite like, I mean, because you, you've obviously you'd gone through all this long education of becoming an architect. So it's quite a courageous move to sort of step out of that quite structured path and move into, you know, quite an adventurous uh idea how did you what what kind of gave you the confidence to be able to do that well at first it wasn't deliberate Mm. i think it's actually never been deliberate to step away so while sam and i were doing the jellies and actually our first real commercial job was a commission by warwick castle to create a 12 course victorian breakfast Mm. which came about when they asked for a jelly but we didn't know how to do this big jelly that they wanted so I started on that project and I actually used that for my architecture diploma for my final piece. Um, and through that, I was looking at the skills I knew in terms of drawing and so on to how to create this meal. Mm. So I was choreographing the wait staff and producing these elaborate plans of how the food would be produced. And then suddenly, I guess I found myself on site just doing it and making it all happen Mm. Um, but it was very architectural to start with because that's all I knew yeah and then from that from that one event it began to grow to larger events so that was our first commercial job where we actually got a bit of money and I guess by the end of it maybe we had a couple of thousand pounds in the bank and then we set about going oh well, we, we have a jelly company and we've always said we can make molds in the shape of anything. Now we really need to get on and do that. Mm. And so Sam entered us for the London Festival of Architecture to have an event and we were going to have this um, architectural jelly banquet. And the idea was to invite architects from all around the world to design one of their buildings in jelly. And then I would have to actually make them. <laughs> they would just get to sketch them and I'd have to make them. And that turned out to be a great thing. Not only did we get loads of entries, so we had likes of Lord Foster and Rogers and Will Orsop and so on. Um, But we then, for some crazy reason, sold 2,000 tickets for an event, uh, which was at UCL in the the quad. And we had to then entertain people. So we were going from a catering company that had only really done one event to now putting on a whole event for a few thousand people. Mm, Amazing. And clearly you've obviously got like a... Where did you learn that you're sort of or get in contact with that kind of entrepreneurial flair to be able to, you know, because there's so many architectural students who will end up just doing projects when they're just kind of in their own, you know, it's just them really. And it's just kind of intense drawing. And here you are as a student and you've kind of enlisted, you're building a team, you're building a small, a small company already just in, in, the, in the one project. Where did that kind of spirit come from? Is it something you've always been doing? You've always been entrepreneurially minded like that or... Was it just kind of out of... I've always been interested in running a company, Mm. uh, but I guess there's no way that I thought it would end up being like it is now. And actually, I think I remember when I started architecture and I was doing my degree, I said to someone probably quite nonchalantly that I wanted to have a company where I I was the architect and there would be a PR person and then a lawyer. Mm. And it's kind of what I've ended up with uh, to some extent, but it's obviously not quite in in architecture. Yeah. Um, but I really enjoy working with Sam because his skill set is so different from mine. And I, I think that's where architects perhaps go wrong is that they team up with other architects mm. who, funnily enough, share very similar skill sets. And Sam and I have really no skill sets in common other than we like doing a good job and can be bothered to push through uh, to the end and what are his what are his skill sets compared to yours so best way of describing it is that when we're cooking a meal i i'm in the kitchen cooking and he's front of house um, serving so on larger projects that means i'm doing the financial things and overseeing production and doing design overseeing the design team mm. but he'll be doing 
those other things that are really important, client management, uh, the PR and the image of it and telling a good story for people coming along. Got it. And how important has that has that been in terms of, you know, your, your sort of uh, relationship with the media? And can you tell us a little bit about the sort of strategies that you've employed to kind of grow the way you have? Well, the, the strategy is fairly simple. It's making sure that everything that we do is interesting to yeah. someone. Uh, and so therefore, it's naturally newsworthy. And that can be in quite crude terms, like making it a world uh, first. But it can be in other ways as well. And ultimately, we need to create events um, where people come along to and that they want to tell their friends about it in the pub and say, oh, you never guess what happened to me when I went along to this thing. Um, so like giving them stories to tell and then that can translate across to the media as well and get them excited about something new. Yeah. Can you give us some examples of some of the most successful ones that you've that you've done? Uh, I think in terms of press, uh, one of my favorite projects is building a boating lake on the roof of Selfridges. Mm. And so that was a huge structural challenge and we had to reinforce uh, the roof and put it's about 70 tons of steel went on the roof and we couldn't use cranes so it was all hand board up and it was in small uh, sections so just really crazy but of course from a press side like no one cares about that so mm. sam did a really good job of working with the designer faye too good to make sure that when people saw the lake it had something that was totally different so it was bright green and had this amazing um pattern and landscape created around it so it was all the details were there and it allows something that was technically very challenging to be uh, appreciated by people yeah amazing yeah and, and as you say that like you've always there's always been like a strong sense of narrative in all of your all of your projects and events and i know that uh i mean i've often ended up like like you say you get people there's a real mastery of how you're able to get people talking about you and then I've kind of often had conversations with people and they're like, oh, I saw this thing with like the alcoholic mystery room or something. And you're like, ah, oh, that sounds like one of Harry's projects. And that's obviously grown into kind of like, you know, quite a niche market. Is there anybody else doing anything like this? Or is this something that you've really kind of created yourselves as being like, you know, this is your, your territory? Yeah, I think now there are lots of people doing similar sorts of things, but we've been doing it for longer Mm. than anyone else and are more experienced and have a much larger team so we're much more prolific and we produce um, well in excess of 150 events every year so there's a lot going on in the studio all the time wow and how big's the team now is so that... the team is 22 and what does they what does that comprise of what are they made out of in terms of like professions and disciplines yeah so there's uh, three main teams one's uh, called events which does event production and also the design team sits within that and catering as well so within events you have design production and catering mm. and then there's content team which is more working for our clients where we do consultancy and they also do more 2d output as well so it might be creating films um, or creating press images or putting booklets and written material together updating the websites that sort of thing. Uh, and then there's a studio management side where finance and HR sits. And how, and how do you acquire clients? How, how is that kind of... People just... you just now in a... Because you're kind of the, the, the go-to people that people just tend to come to you or is there... Have you ever had strategies where you've kind of gone off specific... You know, gone after specific types of clients or... Yeah, lots of clients come through word of mouth or they've just heard of our reputation and they think they have a certain project that would suit us but we've worked with so many different people that there are all sorts of connections mm. out there and stuff just seems to come in and yes we do specifically go after certain people and for us it's it's one thing to have lots of clients come to you but you need to get the right clients and the clients that you can build a longer term relationship with because it's quite tiring having to have a new client on every project yeah because as the business expands, you realize how important it is to have very strong client relationships where you can trust one another and know uh, how to how to serve them and vice versa. And what's been most important in, in nurturing those types of relationships? Well, the most important thing is having good 
client managers, actually. So people who have the time to speak to the clients and listen to them. Mm. So it can't all be done with just a team of designers or chefs or technicians. You actually need people whose job it is to just pick up the phone and talk to the clients. And over the last sort of 10 years, what would you say has been the most sort of, you know, the biggest obstacles that you've overcome and that you're most proud of in terms of, you know, growing growing the company to where it is now? Well, we've always uh, sort of moved and grown organically. So mm. we've never taken any investment in from anywhere. And it's always been, I think the challenge has always been employing people and finding the right people and having the right internal structure. So you've, you've never, you've grown the company without any investment at all. It's all been sort yeah. of just based off the, your project. Every, everything's project just income. been put back in to the company. Yeah. We don't, at the moment, we don't actively invest in anything really. Uh, we're just growing slowly, organically as, as the need arises. And we take punts occasionally on things and get in new, new team members when we think the work's going to allow it mm. and you were saying um beforehand like you know you you think it's you, you kind of cottoned on pretty quickly that actually there's a lot better ways to get paid than purely being paid by you know by the hour by being paid for design services how did you start to expand your business model beyond that of just selling you know design consultancy services to brands for you know for food promotion etc yeah so initially i suppose it was the opposite of that because we weren't being paid a fee anyway so <laughs> we were just providing a service like jelly uh, and then you realize actually you could provide the service and get a fee out of it as well for doing the design and management of it and so on and then you've got a product as well like you know you can sell online with the with the molds and yes well there are a few products but they're not really part of the business right strategy um so actually the way we structure things now is we'd agree a fee with a client um which might change depending on how their needs change and then we'd have a production budget as well and in that production budget it's a bit like acting as a main contractor we mm. then get to control a whole lump sum of money and then we employ a series of subcontractors to deliver certain aspects of it, or we produce some in-house. Right, okay. So you're outsourcing a lot of stuff as well, or is it...? Yeah, so a huge amount of things are outsourced because we don't have the team here to produce everything that we need. Um, so whether it's extra freelance producers on certain projects or whole set-building teams, um, all, all sorts of things outsourced. It can't be done in-house. And so you guys were quite happy to take on that additional risk as the sort of the sort of prof profitability of that seemed much yeah absolutely wiser. so if you if you get it wrong then it's not great but yeah pretty pretty soon I, I suppose historically we wouldn't make much profit from it so we didn't realize that you could mm. uh, and then more recently with actually better budget management you realize you can and should make a profit from doing that whole side of it. Brilliant. And you were saying that you're you're now collaborating with Westfields. Yeah. So we're doing we're doing a number of projects at Westfields. Um, yeah. So we're about to go into we have, we have our second up at the moment. About to go into construction of our third uh, project, which will be at Westfield, London, uh, later in August, and that's building a, a zip line in the main atrium. So we're building a tree house, big fake tree, um, with a zip line going down to the forest floor below. Brilliant. And what, who's that for? That's this, just, just for the mall itself? So that's for Westfield right, itself okay. and Westfield. It's not for a particular client. It's clients. not for a brand. No. Excellent. Amazing. And, and with, with kind of taking on that additional risk as the contractors, do you also have started, you know, what other kind of business assets have you been building or developing? So in, in terms of business assets, um, we're, fairly, we're fairly loose. We don't have that many we have lots of skills our main asset mm. is our staff and knowledge mm. um we have we have one or two other things now so we're more interested in product development and looking at products and how we can grow that stream and um, we've recently bought a holiday house for staff in margate which is overlooking the sea very nice it's quite fun it's a regency disused regency house on top of an arcade um so we're going to be fitting that out shortly um 
but there's all sorts of things we can do in the future as well. And how have you kind of, uh, you know, developed your company culture? Because obviously it's quite, you know, it's quite clear as soon as you get here, it's a very unique place and you've got to be finding the kind of, you know, the right types of people. How have you kind of cultivated that with your staff to kind of ensure that they stick around and how do you how do you sort of um enroll them into your your vision of where you're going and well so every new staff member who starts gets an induction um by sam and there's a whole document that i put together about the company ethos mm. and what we stand for and how we do work um and it's just something you have to reinforce all the time and yes it's going to be much harder to work here than at other places but that's because we do better work and mm. we actually bother and we don't just take the easiest route so if you want to do creative work then it's going to be hard work and do you find that often you might have you know people coming in from different disciplines who are not you know this is quite a unique environment so there's a bit of a sort of tough learning curve yeah there's a very with. steep learning curve because most jobs that people do are relatively formulaic or they run at a pace where you can pick it up as you go <laughs> along but you just can't hear because the pace of projects is so fast that you have to know what's going on all the time and what's expected what's the, the kind standard's of, very high what's the sort of typical turnaround of a project that you might uh i mean our last big project for westfield turned around in seven weeks from uh when we received the brief mm. and then it was effectively six weeks from when we got commissioned and that was creating a whole um, immersive bar environment in, inside one of the shops there where we flooded it built a grotto that you could boat through with a waterfall then created a cave covered in shells where there was a bar inside where mermen was swimming around so <laughs> quite heavy production in six weeks oh, that's fantastic amazing and what's what's next what's the kind of how do you see how do you you want to be growing your growing the business from now so we're doing uh, more work abroad yeah. than ever and we, we have historically done a lot of work abroad but now gosh how do you manage that then? as much as 50 percent of our turnover is probably from uh, work abroad and actually work abroad is quite nice because it's it's easier in many ways because you have to have partners that you can truly rely on mm. um so it, it seems a bit easier to to some extent but we're looking to expand that as well and do larger events abroad and how do you develop those relationships abroad like how do you you know if you end up getting a commission for something then obviously finding the, the team of you know people who are actually going to build the build the installations how do you go about doing that that sounds well a lot of it's just word of mouth and you can find the right people and sometimes you get lucky sometimes you don't but you learn as you go along and i think the 10 years of experience of having similar challenges when when we started out in the industry we didn't know mm. anyone and we certainly didn't even know what industry we were in so that didn't particularly <laughs> help uh, but then after a while you get to know what who, who's good uh, we've worked with lots of people you get to see lots of familiar faces time and time mm. again so i'm sure it's fairly similar but we can bring all sorts of uh, resource out from the uk to uh, foreign places as well right and have you got like a kind of a quite a tight sort of book of a manual of systems that you kind of apply to each project to ensure your you know your standards of quality are always yeah. you know so we have design kind of we have design systems but there's something we're going to expand on as the team expands and be more uh def well define I, I guess much more tightly what has to happen because mm. all the events although they're very different they actually do follow one structure Right, okay. And we know that if certain things are missing, we have checklists, then the event is probably not going to work. And are there projects that you kind of, you know, someone might come to you and you're like, actually, no way, that's not going to work for us? Um, sometimes. We normally try and persuade them to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, often the client doesn't really know mm. what they want. So part of our job is to try and tell them. Help them understand and kind of develop their own. Yeah, because we do, we do more events than... A lot of our clients commission so we have a greater understanding of part of it and what what kind of advice would you give to architects or design students wanting to set up on their own and do their own 
do their own thing. Because I, I mean, I always had you know my admiration for what you guys are doing is that you've really taken like you're not doing architecture, but you're still using kind of that architectural thinking and applying it to something else. And I, actually, I kind of think that a lot of people who go through architectural school would do would do better if they didn't go into an architectural practice and actually followed you know a kind of just a hunch or an intuition about you know actually I can I can do something different here what kind of advice would you give to people who are you know going through that that design education and they want to set up their own business but don't want to do an, a typical architectural practice yeah, I think it's working working out what your connection to the real world is and it's really helpful to have a niche interest mm. and there are so many things in the world it's what it's what I love actually particularly about England is that you can always find someone uh, who's got a really really specialized skill so the other day for an event we need we needed some aprons uh, made we need 250 aprons made with a week's notice and these aprons <laughs> weren't just like cooking aprons but they were based on masonic aprons that had like tassels and funny pockets and all sorts and weird materials and lo and behold uh within <laughs> within a few hours we'd found three manufacturers who just make masonic uh, aprons and we're, we're able to turn around the order Amazing. really quickly but where sam and i starting in jelly Mm. then that actually became our calling card to go all the way around the world yeah. making jelly. So if you've got something that you're really into, like make that your thing and don't worry about the rest because once you've got that nailed, you'll learn lots of business skills in that, then you can twist that and go in any direction that you want. What would you say are the sort of the key ingredients for running a successful practice or a successful design company? Uh, we, well you need to do more work than other people that's yeah. the first one so hard work and not giving up uh, and then just don't give up when the, all the shit things happen because they will happen all the time and actually the bigger the business gets like the bigger the problems <laughs> become so if you just succumb to them then yeah. you'd, you'd um, it'd be over very very quickly and you you saying that you're you're involved uh, teaching at the Bartlett at the moment? Yes, yeah, so I'm doing various bits of teaching on an ad hoc basis there, and actually part of it is teaching normally third years yeah. about how they can be more entrepreneurial. Mm. And I do actually find that maybe the way that people are conditioned, the architects are conditioned, that they do seem to turn their nose up a bit at the thought that they could do, they could make fame and fortune by doing anything other than architecture. Mm. Um, but I, it's just impossible. You cannot go, um, you can't finish your diploma now and expect to get a job as an architect and be successful. Yeah. Just through that, you just can't, you need to do something else. Like that opportunity is long since gone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I totally, totally agree with you there. I think there's a, it's um, really, really important that uh, design students are kind of looking at, you know, applying that creativity to a world of business, being an entrepreneur, all the different ways from, yeah. you know, making products to selling services to, you know, building assets, whether it's in property development to business assets, information. But the best thing about being an architecture student, having that background, is you are, way more advanced in terms of the way you can think mm. than pretty much anyone else out there um now it's going to be in a in a fairly niche but broad area as it were but mm. if you can turn those skills that you have to something else and think quite laterally about it then that's going to put you at a huge advantage yeah and obviously I kind of think the, you know, the strategic skills you have as an architect, being able to sort of step back and see the bigger picture is very powerful for kind of looking and designing, designing a business. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's one thing where like details are really fascinating, just details in buildings. So architects often spend lots of time doing details, but when you go and the average person doesn't notice details but they will notice how they were greeted at the reception and how the person was dressed and what the music was and uh, whether it was a nice day or not and that will all change their mood and mm. by dint that will change their impression of 
the architecture and so design is one thing kind of conventional architecture design but you really need to start designing whole environments and actually from an architecture point of view if you're an architect you can't control everything yeah so why not get into something where you can start controlling more things and have a bigger impact mm. and how would you how do you think that like architectural education can respond to this or start teaching entrepreneurship do you think entrepreneurship is something that can be taught or is it only something that you can kind of learn by doing it and making the mistakes well i think one of the issues perhaps is that the architect is seen from the industry as being the person in control and in charge of everything and that mm. sort of godlike where you know what's going on but then as soon as you become a slightly more experienced architect you realize that actually it's the clients and contractors who are really calling the shots and there's not necessarily so much you can do you know depending this is the majority of of cases um mm. so it's it's what is it i think the education needs to show people that they need to have a greater impact across a wider range of things if, if you actually want to deliver really great architecture you can't just do the design you need to be involved in commissioning and contracting and all sorts of other things that actually make a building mm, yeah and just yeah understanding how to scale up and how to yeah. kind of not be involved in just yeah just doing drawings brilliant thank you very much well, harry thank you. really it's really great, great to talk to you really really fascinating and uh, you know congratulations on on everything it's very inspiring to see so that is a wrap thank you for listening The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.